Good morning. morning. It's wonderful to see each of you in God's house this morning. I have several announcements to share. Um, In Sunday school, we were a little bit lighter today. How many of us didn't have power when we got up this morning? That was, we're going to use that as as a reason. Um, and, And the rain. But if you didn't come a little bit earlier for Sunday school today, we encourage you to do that next Sunday. Lots of great things going on during the Sunday school hour. Youth will be having prime time tonight from 5 to 7 at my house. Um, A couple of announcements from the outreach committee. We are going to be doing a drive-through trunk or treat. So if you have been faithful, you know this will be our third annual trunk or treat. We've had traditional trunk or treat. We've had indoor trunk or treat. And this year we're doing drive-through trunk or treat. So I don't know if we're going to consider this the third annual or not. But... um, If you um, can participate in that, that's fabulous. Please see a member of the outreach committee. Or if you want to just help with that event by bringing some candy, please consider doing that because last year, you know, we did, we were blessed with a good attendance for that activity. Um, The outreach committee will also be meeting in the youth room immediately following worship. Then if you have not seen shoe boxes in the foyer, they are out there and we are moving towards that event coming up Um, dedication is on November the 15th so if you have not taken home a shoebox or if you want to pick up some items items for that please do that and make a note of that coming up a couple of additional announcements today is the day we emphasize global hunger relief at the moment for missions time dr. Palmer will be telling a little more about how our gifts for global hunger relief fund aid those in need envelopes like these can be found near our offering plates. If you would like to contribute to the Global Hunger Fund Relief, please place your gift in one of these designated envelopes and place it in the offering plate. The WMU Morning Circle will be meeting at 10.30 a.m. tomorrow, October 12th, for a short organizational meeting in the Willing Worker Sunday School classroom. That's adult three. Please bring your own bag lunch. That must mean it's going to be a long meeting. Oh, no. Um, We extend our deepest sympathy to the family and friends at the death of Lois Rickman on Friday, October the 9th. Funeral arrangements are still pending. The lovely flowers in the sanctuary this morning are given to the glory of God and in loving loving memory of Chris Johnson by daughter Meg Owens and family. And then today, we are fortunate to have as our guest speaker, Dr. Michael Palmer. Dr. Palmer was called to the pastoral ministry in 1972 and has served five churches in various capacities. Hollins Road Baptist Church as associate pastor from 1974 to 75. He served as a pastor at the following churches, Fellowship Baptist Church in Northwestern Indiana from 1978 to 1981, Mineral Springs Baptist Church in Bedford County from 1981 to 1988, Green Ridge Baptist Church in North Roanoke from 1988 to 2014, and has served as a transitional pastor at Riverdale Baptist Church in the southeast city of Roanoke from 2015 to 2017. Pastor Palmer received a Bachelor of Business Administration degree from Roanoke College in 1974, a Master's of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in 1978, and a Doctor of Ministry from Southwestern in 1994. Pastor Palmer has been married to his wife Hazel since June of 1973, and we're thrilled that she's with us today. They have two children, Daniel J. Palmer, currently the pastor of North Rono Baptist, and Susan P. Engel, a lawyer in Chase City, Baton, Virginia. Michael and Hazel enjoy their four grandchildren, one girl, and three boys, and we are certainly excited that you will be sharing with us today. Again, it's wonderful to see each of you in God's house. I hope you are blessed by your time here at Bedford Baptist.
and good morning. And uh, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, it's so good to be here. Thank you for these precious, sweet people in this church. Uh, and Father, we ask you today to join us uh, with your Holy Spirit's presence and move in our hearts and encourage us. We just want to thank you for who you are, what you've done, what you're going to do. And would you join me now in closing with the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, I was so glad to see that you all were participating in the uh, Global Hunger Relief Offering, and God uses that in so many different ways uh, around the world, and it's a tremendous need, having been in probably, I guess, a dozen or so different countries and uh, seeing missionaries around the world. Uh, they are used of God, and you are helping make that possible. Global Hunger Relief. It's the new name for Southern Baptist World Hunger Fund. Uh, every gift to the Global Hunger Fund, 100% of it, goes to meet hunger needs in North America and overseas. That's possible because Southern Baptists give to the cooperative program and missions offering. Global Hunger Relief meets crisis hunger needs and catalyzes change in conditions that cause hunger. <clears throat> Missionaries and partners use resources in gospel-centered projects. Global Hunger Relief plays a strategic role in taking the good news to unreached and unengaged people groups overseas and lost multitudes in urban North America. Global Hunger Relief helps in a variety of ways such as aiding orphans, widows, refugees, sex trafficking victims, providing pure water, famine relief, job skills, and working with family micro businesses. And you've already been told about the offering envelope and to use that and uh, to give as the Lord leads and continue to give. Um, you can give not only at this time of the year, but really any time you can designate something for that need and that would be an aw awesome thing to do. And just let me say, it's a joy to be here. I uh, uh, did not know your past pastor, but he was in the Roanoke area serving the same time I was for a little while. And uh, you're at an interesting time in the life of your church. Uh, uh, you know, you layer in the fact you, a pastor is, has left after 25 years of ministry and service, and then you layer in COVID on top of that. And it's like, wow, we never saw this one coming, you know. And uh, so uh, it's, it's a time and an opportunity for you all to, uh, to sort of take a step back and to take a look at the church, the challenges of the community, uh, the challenges of doing church uh, in the culture in which we live. And so uh, I'll be praying for you and uh, I'll be praying for that even right now. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this church, its legacy over the years, uh, and God, that it has had a consistent witness that's made a difference in the lives of so many people. But Father, even today in our culture, uh, and even with the disease that we're dealing with and uh, this COVID, uh, it just seems like, Lord, it's a little harder to do gospel work, a little bit more difficult. And that, Father, we pray that you would guide this church to take a look at itself, a look at the community, and maybe to re-engage with, uh, Lord, some, uh, a new direction and a new life and a new spirit for the next chapter. I pray you would guide them to, their, uh, to the intentional interim, and I pray that uh, they would have a good season together and that, God, they, they would come out of that uh, as they look for the, uh, the, the next pastor and the next chapter of their life. I pray, God, that it would be a new day, a new vision, and give them a new joy. And so we thank you again for this church and the opportunity to make a difference here. In Jesus' name, amen.
Wasn't that beautiful? That was good stuff. Thank you, Lord. I just appreciate the, uh, the preparation and the work done in the, for the music today. It's blessed my heart so very much just to, to be a, a part of that and just to listen to that. It's been great. In fact, uh, as Susan was on the organ a minute ago, I uh, hearkened back to a day uh, when I was in seminary and we had uh, about 3,000 voices, mostly guys, some gals, but about 3,000 voices uh, singing in chapel and with the organ in the background trumpeting out the music and it was just one of those experiences that you never forget and when she cranked down on the organ a minute ago I almost wanted to get up and shout uh, but uh, it was it was awesome you know and I just uh, appreciate that so so very much now uh, what a joy it is to be here and uh, having been a transitional pastor and uh, being involved in church health being trained in church health uh, let me in encourage you before I even start the message to take the next chapter in the life of your church and, and, and I, I say this in a positive way, use it as an opportunity to examine everything you're doing in the life of the church in light of the purpose of the church and what you want to do and what you feel God has put upon your heart for the next chapter. Take a look at yourself, how things are done, how things are organized structurally and you know, how things are, are doing and just, just take a look at it because it, it's a great opportunity as in this interim period to you know, make a few vector changes. And you know, I'll be honest with you, if, if we can't learn a few things and make a few changes that we're not growing, and, and we need to just be aware of that and, and look at what, uh, at what the next chapter might be for the life of the church. And by the way, it, it, I don't know if it's just me, I'm getting old, but uh, man, the, the culture seems to be coming a part of the seams, doesn't it? And uh, things are getting a little weird in our world, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's bizarre, actually. You know, it really is. And so uh, churches, uh, we still have the wonderful, awesome gospel message that people so desperately need. But as we're going to see here today, people don't even know that they need it. And part of our challenge is to help them to see that. I want you to uh, turn in your Bibles, if, if you have a Bible, and I'm sure there are some pew Bibles if you want to do that, in Ephesians chapter 2. It's a familiar passage. You know this, but uh, just a reminder of where we have come from in, in coming to know Christ personally and what he has done in our life. So listen up, and this is one of my favorite passages uh, of Scripture uh, in the New Testament in Ephesians 2 and it says and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of, of the mind and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, I love those two words, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Most people do not understand, especially the people in our culture and the course of the world in which we live, most people do not understand how bad the situation is between them and God. Dead here, they, they, the word is spiritually dead. You were dead in trespasses and sins, and dead means totally unable to do anything to produce any righteousness to be accepted by God. It means that the inclinations of the heart, the thought, the words, the deeds, all of that were missing the mark of glorifying God. Now, we're not saying here that a person is incapable of doing good in relationship to others in the culture, but we are saying that even when a person does his or her best, that action still does not work up to God's standards of holiness or righteousness. John Calvin said this, that an unregenerate person could perform natural good, 
But those acts of civic goodness or moral good or, or generally conducting oneself in a virtuous manner, those do not amount to any merit before God. In fact, the Bible teaches that mankind <laughs> in making up their own standards is not good because mankind can't even live up to its own standards. We come up with something we think is good, good enough, and we kind of try to do that. And as, as we know, we can't even fulfill what we want to do on our own, even apart from God. So with respect to spiritual state, we're spiritually, mankind is spiritually dead, okay? And so, so the, uh, the problem though is that people measure themselves based upon what people do and how good they're being educated and they're furthering themselves with their life and all of that. So the whole concept of sin, the whole concept of uh, uh, sin having sway over people is a, is a concept that's foreign to many people. We're living in a day when there is no objective truth outside of the individual person. People are doing what's right in their own eyes. Can I get an amen? They really are. People are doing what's right in their own eyes, that there is no outside objective standard of truth. So, but being spiritually dead means we can do nothing. Dead means dead. Dead is dead. You can't, you know, a dead man's not gonna get up and start running around. They're dead, okay? So dead is dead. And so we, we are incapable of doing anything to please God. And, and we, these children know this verse. We've all learned this verse, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. By the way, that's in present tense. All have sinned and are still coming short of the glory of God. And so uh, I like to use the analogy uh, for, to try to explain this to, to folks. I like to use the analogy. I, we used to go to the beach a lot when we were raising kids and stuff. And, you know, I kind of, I don't know why I thought of this, but I said it would be like having everybody line up on the, uh, at Myrtle Beach, all the people in the world line up on uh, the at, at Atlantic uh, co coastline in the United States and say this, if you're going to be saved, what you have to do is to swim to England in order to be saved. I mean, that's kind of how it is, okay? So, and, and you know, me, I would flagellate around about 50 feet out, and I'd be sinking pretty quickly, okay? This fat would go down pretty quick. I'm just saying. And so, but there'd be others that would probably swim and do quite, maybe some guy might make it 20, 30, 40, 50 miles. I mean, he would do quite well. And, you know, I, I'm sure he would look back and, see me suffering as I'm going down and say, sorry, buddy, I'm better than you. And, and so our culture does the very same thing then. What we do in the culture, we have people that can make it a little further and you know, do pretty good and look good to others and, you know, and they can look back at others that are not doing as well, not making it quite as far, and they can say that I'm better than you. And of course, that's a superfluous judgment. They, people will say that no matter, they have all kinds of different standards. So Paul is saying to this church, he's saying that none of us was going to make it. None of us was going to get there, you know. And so, by the way, how silly it is for the guy who maybe could swim 50 miles to look back at the guy that swam 50 feet and say how much better I am because guess what happens? They're all going down. Nobody's gonna make it, amen? They're all going down. There's nobody that's gonna meet the standard that is there, set there by the Lord God. And so this, uh, it's a spiritual state of deadness. And this reminder of former deadness is to give them cause for rejoicing now because they're in Christ. So a spiritually dead person is caught up in the trespasses and sins. The theological term for this is the depravity of man. The depravity of man. The, the, we've been affected by sin and the adversary, and we're walking in the pattern of life according to the course of this world. Now, we don't really like to hear this, but they and we outside of Christ were under the influence of what Paul calls the prince of the power of the air. You say, man, that's a little bit scary, you know? 
But folks, listen, this is spiritual reality that is present in, especially in the culture. Now, Paul knew that this would not be popular with the religious people of his day or our day for that matter. But he's trying to remind them of how bad the, uh, the, the church used to be outside of Christ. And they were involved in uh, idol worship and all this stuff. And they were really far from, from God. But folks, there is a spiritual reality in this world. And it's a spiritual reality that involves a real adversary to Jesus, the devil, and his demons. Now, you cannot tell me, after looking at some of the news channels that you do not believe there is an evil presence in this world, there is. And that permeates a lot of the main structures in our culture. And we need to be very apprised and understand what we're dealing with. Paul is saying that pervaded everything. And before they were in Christ, the church at Ephesus, they were under the influence and the authority of the spirit of this world. John MacArthur said, to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, is to think and live according to the, listen now, the presuppositions, the ideologies, and the standards over which sin and Satan have control. And it is to be dominated by evil, supernatural beings. Satan's supreme purpose for mankind is not to get them to only do evil things, but to think and believe evil things, especially about God. And when I say that, when I quote that, I think about, and I hate to say this, but I think about what is present in much of the culture in the universities in our nation today. Folks, there is an underlying anti-God bias in a lot of the university culture today. And it's no wonder we have ended up with in America, what we've ended up with. Just as an aside, I wasn't going to say this, but I'll, I'll throw it in. It's no extra charge. Uh, but you know, I just want you to, to, that years ago, about 40 years ago, for every five uh, liberals that taught in the university uh, system in America, there were at least two, maybe three conservatives. Today, that ratio is 13 to 1. 13 liberal ideology to one conservative ideology. That ought to tell you something about what's going on in the culture in America. And so we've, we are uh, in, in kind of a mess. But you know what that says to us? That the spiritual need we're seeing in the culture is deeper than it ever has been. There are more people that don't know God uh, in Bedford in this county than ever before. And there's an opportunity for this church to make an awesome difference with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it's awesome. So every person outside of Christ, they pretty much do what they want to do. And uh, I mean, even Paul, you think about Paul. I mean, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He sat under the best teacher in Jerusalem, Gamaliel, and yet Paul put himself in the category of being the chief of sinners. So even Paul, the most educated man, and one of the most educated men in all of history, says he was the chief of sinners. So he put himself in the category of fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. In other words, you come up with what you want to do and you just do it. And that uh, spirit of disobedience is in our culture. And so once the mind is broken over in that direction, it goes in that direction without even giving it a second thought, just like what we see around us. Now, but here's the issue, the main issue. The danger is, is that in the church, we make light of our need and we make light of our spiritual depravity before we came to Christ and thereby we make light of the cross of Christ and the gospel itself. You see, if we say, oh, I wasn't that bad. I wasn't, you know, I was raised in a Christian home. I, I've heard people say, well, my granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. Well, la ti da You know? What does that do? Did it rub off on you? 
But I mean, we, there's all kinds of weirdness out there. People want, want to say this or that. Listen, folks, what, what we have to realize is that we were just like this. Paul is talking about all of us, okay? Now, here's the great thing about that. Once you make, uh, the, uh, make that true, once you uh, uh, see that as true, it makes grace even more awesome. I mean, how foolish it is. How foolish it is for a guy to say, I could swim further than you, man. I could make it 50 miles, but guess what? We're all going down. And, you know, we all stand in the same place of absolute need. And, by the way, that illustration actually falls short a little bit because when Jesus came to save us, it wasn't like, well, we worked this much, we tried as best we can, and we got this far, and he took us the rest of the way. No, that's not what happened. Guess what happened? We were uh, in total, absolute need, total depravity, couldn't do anything to help ourselves, and he had to come down and, and, and grab us and get hold of us and reach down and grab our hearts. So we didn't make any progress, y'all out there? He came to save us. And once we understand that, it makes the cross and what he's done so much more wonderful. He's an awesome God. And so, dead in trespasses and sins also means that we're under the wrath of God. Now, there's a lot of folks don't like to hear this, but by the way, is God a God of wrath? Yes, he is. If he, for him to be holy... There has to be wrath against sin. So that's part of his holiness, part of his purity. And so we were by nature, I don't really like to hear this, but we were by nature children of wrath. Oh my goodness. But listen to me, friend. If there's no wrath, then there's no gospel. If there's no punishment for sin, then we don't need the cross. So we have to understand that there was wrath coming towards us and praise God when we come to Jesus, we're saved from that wrath. And by the way, what happened to that wrath? If it's possible, Father, take this cup from me. And when Jesus hung on Calvary, he drank the whole cup of wrath that was meant for me and meant for you. He drank it all down to the last drop. He took the dregs of the wrath of God for me, for you. What a Savior. And what happens when we see that, that makes the Savior, it makes the cross even all that more wonderful. So it's difficult today because people in our culture they really don't even understand this. They really don't know this, okay? Now, I will say this. Because of the fact that uh, I like what Blaise Pascal said, he said there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man that you know, makes a man wonder, where is he at? Is there an answer to life? There's something here. There's gotta be something more. And so uh, I think there's an innate uh, awareness in our conscience that there's something or someone we owe. And so thank God for that. But most of the culture, we do not, uh, and we're not aware of the sin problem. So in order to rightly come to Jesus, people have got to understand the situation in order to rightly repent and be able to know why they need to repent in order to come to Christ and trust in him. So, you know, we're living in a culture where this message is becoming more repugnant to people. And so it's important that we live out grace, that we live in love, that we live that new life, and so un until people see and understand their complete inability, they'll never understand and cry out to God that it's his ability through Jesus to save them. And of course, they must believe that Jesus is real and will answer them when they call upon him. You know, there are a lot of convenient atheists out there. A lot of people that, you know, they just don't want to talk about it. I have some of those in my family. You know, they... They, you know, I'm the, I'm the one preacher in my family. Okay, well, now my son is too. But anyway, it's like, you know, they put it over there and they, they're, they, they say that's nice, it's good for you, but they don't want to get too close to it. Like it's getting too close to, to the flame. And they don't want to deal with things that 
uh, makes them realize that they've got to deal with the problem of their sin and the Savior and the, the, the need for, for him. So, so to me, this is why the most beautiful words in the Bible, these two words, but God. I was dead in trespasses and sin under the prince of the power of the air. Man, I was under the influence of evil. I didn't have a clue about anything, but God, but God intervened. The most wonderful words, and what did he do? He made us alive together with Christ. And so he works in a person and on a person, and he changes them from the inside out. New creations in Christ Jesus. And so, folks, I, I, I tell people often that, uh, you know, this message of the gospel ought to be something that we live and we enjoy every day. And don't ever get over the fact where you came from and where Jesus has brought you to in Christ. We've been changed from death to life in our inner man, our mind, our will, our desires, that's all been changed. And notice that Paul places himself with the Ephesians when he says God made us alive. So, and by the way, this being made alive is not a process. You can take a process of coming to the realization that you need Christ, that's a process. But when you're made alive, that is a point, the verb tense actually here means it's a point in time event where boom, you move from death to life. And that is a supernatural act of the Spirit of God on you, bringing you from death to life. And what an awesome thing it is. I tell people sometimes I get a little silly and uh, I say, you know what? I'm so glad I got saved. I never got over it. Y'all will get that in a minute. Seriously, so glad I got saved, I ain't never got over it. By the way, if you're saved, you never can get over it. Can I get an amen? amen. So, you know, uh, folks, this spiritual reality is something we ought to reckon on every day. Thank you, God, where you brought me from, where you brought me to. So uh, this whole thing is supernatural, and that's where people have a problem. Let's, let's face it, the academy, the university system, doesn't want to believe in anything supernatural. But we live and, and breathe in the church of the living God, and we know that we wouldn't be here were it not for the supernatural power and hand of God that changes from death to life. Thank you, God. What, what a Savior. And so, dead people cannot make dead people alive. Only someone with a capital S only someone else outside of that spiritual deadness can do that. Only someone who has the power of life and death can make a dead person alive. So I thank God that that power raised up Jesus and raises us up from death to life. So the change that happens is not a person reforming their life. It's not trying harder. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. Uh, how many of you have tried hard to lose weight? It's, it's rough, you know? I remember looking around, one is about over 15 years ago now, and looked at my, and I saw a picture of myself, and I was in the pool, I was down at Myrtle Beach, I was in a pool with the kids. And I looked at myself, I said, is that me? I, it was awful. I was uh, close to 65 pounds heavier than what I am now. I was a big boy. But you know, that, that losing weight thing, trying harder, sometimes it doesn't work, does it? And so, you know, how it, it, so we want to get delivered from the trying harder to resting and being obedient to the grace and the spirit and the word of God as he changes us from the inside out and changes our water. It's only through recognizing that our trying harder only makes things worse. Then we can come in brokenness and repentance to Jesus Christ. And he changes us. And by the way, how you get in is how you go on. How did you come to Jesus? You had to repent. You had to realize that your sin put him there on the cross. 
that you needed to turn from self and sin. You needed him. You were dead in trespasses and sin. And you needed to repent and believe and surrender. That's how you got in. And as we walk with him, that realization of the need for daily repentance, brokenness, the need to be pliable under his hands and his voice is daily. So, yes, we cried out to him to be born again, to be saved. But we continue to cry out to him for his input and direction and guidance and peace and strength and everything in our life. Amen? It's not, listen, it's the beginning of a lifetime of repentance and brokenness. How you get in is how you go on every day. It's wonderful. So, grace, by grace, we've been singing about it, I'm mean, playing it today in music. Grace, we've been saved. Grace is the loving kindness of God whereby he does in and on us what we cannot do for ourselves. It is the gift of God shown in the cross of Christ and the shedding of his blood as he bore our sins. And by the way, folks, the you have been saved, for you English majors out there, that's a perfect passive participle. What does that mean? That you have been saved, that means it's a point in time where God, Almighty God, did something in you and on you that he cannot revoke. And the work of that and the presence of his spirit and his word and what he has done, bringing you from death to life, will never end. It's still going on right now. You have been saved. Glory to God. Nobody can mess with that. So you say, that's, that's a wonderful thing. It's a past completed action that cannot be undone. Hendrickson put it well, the commentator Hendrickson, he said, Christ sends forth the spirit into the hearts of believers so that they die to sin and are raised to newness of life. Therefore, both as the, to the state and the condition, we can say that with Christ Jesus, we ourselves were tried, condemned, crucified, and buried, but also made alive and raised up to sit and be set in heavenly places. Sure, there's a time factor, but our right to receive everything we have in Christ has been fully secured and our new life in the heavenlies has already begun, uh, started, and even now our life is hid with Christ in God. He goes on to say, our names are inscribed in heaven's register. Our interests are being promoted there. We're being governed by heavenly standards and motivated by heavenly impulses. The blessings of heaven constantly descend upon us. Heaven's grace fills our hearts. Its power enables us to be more than conquerors and to heaven our thoughts aspire and our prayers ascend. William Hendrickson. And so... We have amazing grace where if you understand where you came from and how bad the situation really was, the fact that you were depraved, you could not make yourself right. Nothing you would ever do. And Jesus Christ came and sought you out in that state and helped you to realize your helplessness and draw you unto him and to receive his forgiveness to trust him as Lord and Savior. Folks, that transforming work of regeneration, what was the purpose of it? It's that we might be a display of his grace to the world. We're to be a display of his grace. Bedford Baptist Church is to be a display of God's grace to this county and beyond. That's what you're to be. And so, folks, there is no substitute for a changed life. And so everybody knows that, uh, about the grace that will come out of you. It's impossible to produce a grace-filled life on your own. Only God can do it through the power of his spirit. Only God can produce the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
if there was ever a time when you needed self-control in America, it was today. Self-control. Only a supernatural intervention can change the hard heart of man. Only the blood of Jesus can break the yoke of stubbornness that keeps a person from Jesus. I want to ask, uh, I want people to ask of us as born again people when they see the fruit of the Spirit coming out of us, I'd like for somebody to say, what, what happened to you? I mean, what got into you? And so they ought to be able to be asking that and say, you know, I'd like to just say, I got saved. Jesus changed me. I'm no longer the same. I got a case of the can't help it. Y'all will get that in a minute. Can't help but do what's right. Can't help but love God. Can't help but love people. Uh, you know, uh, something happened to me. I can't totally explain it. All I know is that a person, namely Jesus, got hold of me. And by the way, you all weren't theological experts when you got saved. You didn't know much of the Bible. All you know is you got saved. And Jesus came into your heart and changed you and touched you and made you new. Hallelujah and praise the Lord that we're to be a, a testimony to the grace of God now and forever. And my, let me just say, uh, I could sense in your heart and in the life of this church, just coming in this place, that the grace of God was here. I could sense that in your, in your life and in your hearts. And that God has a plan for this church. And it's going to be good. Amen? So God has a way. God has a, 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 a way forward for you. But folks, if that's to be, if this is true, and it is, we were saved to be a display for Jesus showing the marvelous grace of God to all mankind. That means that we are to be engaging this world as much as we possibly can. It's not time to go to the bunker. It's time to come out and do the best we can to engage the culture. And when you have the trunk or treat, and man, I know you had one outside, one inside, and one now drive by, praise God. You know, oh, look out, I just did it for three years, and now you, it's, it's different every year. And so, uh, you know, you're just doing the best you can. But listen, if you're going to give them candy, give them some Jesus. Amen? Give them some Jesus while you're doing that. Give them some of the gospel. Do something to give them something that these kids can get into and, and to, to get something of the message of the gospel. Folks, people and families are not raising their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. They need help from us as we engage the community. There, I tell you what, there's some lost dudes in this county, wouldn't you say? I know y'all know lost people in your own family. You know lost people in your work, your, your business, or, or whatever. But we've got to show them Jesus. That's our joy, and that is our job. And by the way, it is a labor. It takes work. It, is, uh, it takes spiritual sweat, and it's not easy. But let me say to you this, and I've... I believe this with all my heart. Folks, the work of the Lord ought to be a joy. The work of the Lord, God forbid we say it, but it ought to be fun. It ought to be fun to be a Christian. You ought to be, and I hate these masks because nobody can see a smile, amen? You know, but it ought to be fun to be a believer. You're smiling, I can tell. But it's, it's part of the, what God has given us because of where we've come from. We were in a mess. You may have been raised in a Christian home. I was not. If I get to come back, I'll tell you my testimony on that. It's, it's an amazing, amazing story of the grace of God and God breaking family dysfunction. I got saved. I never got over it. So what did we learn here today? We've learned that we're all dead in sin, unable to get right with God. We've learned that that deadness was worse than any of us ever thought. We've learned that we all deserve the fiery judgment of God, the wrath of God. But God stepped in, took that wrath on the person of his son, 
and made us alive. And being made alive is a totally supernatural process. We're not helping God out. <laughs> okay? We didn't get part of the way and then, you know, we helped God out a little bit and he, he kind of took me the rest of the way. No, you didn't have anything to give. You with me here? And once we understand that, his grace becomes so wonderful. We're now in a position, we're together with God in his presence. Our lives are changed by God's grace. We're to be a display for the world. And the last thing is we have work to do in the sense that we are to engage this world with Jesus' love. That the world might see his marvelous grace. We don't just do stuff for a lost world. We go uh, to a lost community in the world. We don't do stuff just for ourselves. And that's even as you think about the church. And I would do this with my churches. Let's look at the calendar and everything that's going on. And how much on the calendar is about us doing administrative stuff for us. And how much on the calendar is stuff that we're doing to try to engage a lost world. That'll change the church calendar, folks, if you start asking those questions. Okay? Just say it. That's very important. And uh, I've been doing church all my life, I know. It's easy to get caught up. And so, I once was lost, but my self-centered life, in that lifestyle, but God intervened, drew me unto himself, and made me alive through the operation of his Holy Spirit. This morning, you may not be sure about your relationship to Jesus Christ. You may want to come to know him. We'll be here uh, even at the end or even after the service to try to help you. If you'd like to ask any questions at all, we'd be glad to help. You know, sometimes it takes a long time for us to get to the place where we say, Lord, I give up. I give up. I'm tired of trying to fix it, everything. I give up. I can't fix anything anymore. And I repent. And I need you. Take my life. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Change me. I need you, Lord Jesus. You can do that this morning. You can do it any time. It would be great if you could do it today. And tell him that you need him. You may be a member of a church, this church or another church, but folks, listen, it, it, that, that doesn't really matter. If you don't have that assurance, then you need to repent and come to Christ today. It has been my joy to be here today with you, uh, to speak to you. Let me close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time in the Word. I hope it was helpful and instructive and encouraging uh, to this church. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I was going to bring with me today a few things uh, to give to your church. Uh, I, I have books in my ministry office on church health and things of that nature. And I left the, uh, I had a Sunday school class at North Roanoke and I left without bringing them with me today. I'm going to try to send them to you and just let you have them, you know, and you can do what you want to with them. I think it'd be a blessing to you. So let's uh, close again with a word of prayer. Can, can we stand? Let's all stand. Thank you for letting me come. It was great to be here. Father God, we ask your covering 
over this church. Thank you for the people serving here, the graciousness in their hearts that we have already experienced even today. And what a joy it has been to meet them. And Father, they're searching for a, a new shepherd in the days and months and even the next year or two to come. Please help them, God, to uh, take a good look at themselves and to uh, examine what might need to be uh, put in, taken out, whatever. Help them, oh God, and to uh, take a look at the county and the community around them. And I know that Bedford County is not the same as it was even uh, eight or ten years ago. Things are changing around here. And so, God, there's so much need, so much spiritual need, much more spiritual need even that there, than there used to be. And so, Father, I ask you again to please cover and help, guide, give this church a sense of your grace as they move forward. You're an awesome God. Thank you where you brought us from and where you, where you have taken us to. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you.